It's amazing how in this hour the Bible offends so many people because there's so many theologies and doctrines about the subject of worship that are not in the Bible. And I remember when I started studying worship, I did it because, let's, let's understand a couple of things. I, I kind of landed in worship backwards. Um, I was a musician first and uh, wanted to be a full-time producer. I wanted to produce albums, write songs, and travel and do missions work. And I landed in Nashville, Tennessee doing just that. And I was a ranger uh, at Christchurch, uh, Nashville for Christchurch Choir many years. And then wound up in Brownsville Assembly, which is not in Brownsville, Texas. It's actually Pensacola, Florida, a little suburb, uh, the red light district, if you will, of Pensacola. And uh, wound up there and did not expect what happened. Was told that revival was coming, but how many have heard revival is coming? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, good. That's nice. That'll be great. What is that? <laughs> Because revival in my mind was three nights or seven nights. You know, we had revival every year. We had a summer revival every year, a spring revival, a fall revival, right? But what's revival? You know, according to, I didn't even know a lot about revival. And I wound, I wound up at uh, Brownsville at the church, Assembly of God. And I was there about a month and a half and uh, revival fell. And it was an immediate change in the response of the people to the presence of God. In the midst of all that, uh, I had never been much of a singer, still I'm not much of a singer, never fancied myself to be a singer. I was a player, I played. And uh, I wanted to be a musician, I didn't want to be a singer. And here I am up in front of these people singing, and my band is very hodgepodge because we're just a local church. I mean, we're not, we're not ready for an international revival. <laughs> You know, my drummer is a UPS delivery guy. I mean, I, you know, and the choir, I'd only been there a month and a half. We only knew six songs. And, and so the revival sprung on us like that. And man, it was every night. Start at seven o'clock and probably the first six months of revival, probably I could remember 30 to 45 days or more that I went home at sunup and uh, go to the Waffle House on the way home from church and have breakfast with everybody and go home and try to sleep a few hours and come back and do it again. And so it was a phenomenal time. But in the midst of that, I began to be handed all these worship books. I've got everybody's worship book. Somebody gave it to me. And one day I was, you know, revival was happening. We were in church all the time. So I didn't have a lot of reading time. You know, just trying to get music together was about all I could do. And so I just piled them in a box and... Uh, and I, and I thought, you know, I need to really understand what worship is. I mean, I know if you're a Christian, you've been a believer, you kind of know or you think you know what worship is from the Scripture. And I thought, you know what? Fooey on everybody's book. I'm going to go to the real bo the book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the one that Apostle Paul used, the King James Version. And, and so... Right, And so I'm going to just look all these definitions up and I'm going to figure this thing out. And I was reading two books at the time and I recommend it highly. I love uh, Dr. Cutshaw has great books. Uh, many of my friends have great books and I love all their books. But I have a penchant and a, and a favorite. I love dead people. I read dead people's books. And the reason I love dead people's books is... I'd only, I only read the ones who finished well. Because Paul said, if I end badly, I kind of forfeit the whole race. Right? So once a brother has gone to heaven and he did it without blowing it and making a big mess, he's safe to read. Anyway, of course, there's some live ones that are safe to read too, but. Uh, so I don't read the, the latest, greatest. So there was lots of books. So I just went to the scripture and I was reading two books at the time. I was reading my utmost for his highest every day. And my favorite book to this day of all time, I give it to every new member of our church. I recommend it highly above every book that you could read. It's written by A.W. Tozer, 
The Pursuit of God. My favorite book. If you haven't read the book, you should read it. It's not long. And I'm going to start our teaching today with a quote from A.W. Tozer. This quote in The Pursuit of God probably changed my life as much as anything that I could possibly tell you. This quote. Because I've, I've been a musician. I'm a pastor's son. I, I worked with choirs for years, musicians for years. And I was trained. And again, if I say anything that's your normal in your church, just get mad and, and get over it, okay? I'm not here to correct everybody. I'm going to tell you the things I have learned. Is that okay? I'm not here to be the end-all high sheriff of heaven and if I, whatever I say is right and everybody else is wrong. I'm just going to tell you what I believe to be true, okay? Is that all right? I was trained in Pentecostal church. How many came tonight with a need? We just opened the service with that. How many have a need? That is the dumbest question in the world. Because I can't imagine a day I haven't had a need. And you usually followed up, how many need a breakthrough? How many need a breakthrough today? Okay. And guess what? Next week, you'll need another one. And... In the Pentecostal church I grew up with, my dad was a pastor for 45 years. Sunday morning, we kind of yawned our way through, but Sunday night was the service. Like the Holy Ghost came on Sunday night. And we'd stay and stay and stay. And, you know, Pentecostals worship very exuberantly. And, and I started noticing something as a 12-year-old boy playing drums. I started noticing that once everybody hit that high, that, whoa, the Lord is great, and everybody dance and speak in tongues and have a good time, they'd shut it down and we'd go home and go, go to the barbecue place and get a, get a burger, and it was over. Now, as a 12-year-old, this had to be a download from the Lord. I'm at, at the drums, and I'm going, wait a minute, where does God get his part? You just got yours. Where's his? That you showed up with a need and you sang a few songs. Do you felt better? Are you waited on the visitation of his glory so you could spend it on yourself? So you could make it through one more week? If I'm God and I'm coming to watch you worship, what do I get out of it? As a 12-year-old, that revolution, re revolutionized my thinking. Then I picked up A.D. Tozer's book and he says this, God is a person. And in the deep of his mighty nature, he thinks, wills, enjoys, feels, loves, desires, and suffers as any other person may. Lights went on. Wait a minute. You're telling me that God, now again, this phrase does not bring God down to humankind. He's, he's supreme. You know, a lot, of, a lot of theology these days is bringing God down to a schoolgirl crush. That he's my buddy and I'll jump up in his lap and play in his beard. Hence, we have no fear of the Lord in the church. Right? So that, that theology, part of it's right. You're going to find throughout the years of your learning you're watching, wherever you're watching this, you're going to learn that brothers and sisters in Christ come with certain pieces of revelation. Okay? But I want you to think of the truth different than a truth. Let's start there. It's a truth that without faith it's impossible to please God. It's a truth that God is a spirit and they that worship us worship in tr spirit and truth. It's a truth that hell is real. It's a truth that heaven is real. It's a truth that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you today. It's a truth that God put into... All those are truths within themselves. But the truth is made up of a truths. I want you to look like... Imagine a brick wall behind me. And every brick is a truth. But... Fitly joined together, as Paul said, line upon line, precept upon precept. When that wall is built, it's all the truth. And what a lot of times revelation, and again, this is fine, but I have revelations, right? You have revelations. But to take a revelation and make it the truth is to ignore all the other truths 
that would balance your revelation. The Word of Faith movement from the 80s was a wonderful thing. But it got out of balance in a couple of places because someone would have an arm falling off and you go, what's going on? I'm, I'm coming down with healing. Well, the doctor just said you have cancer. Oh, I'm, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm alive. I'm going, you got cancer. I'm not sick. I'm the right stuff. God of Christ. Again, all those are truths. It's great to confess the scriptures. God is a divine healer. Speak what you desire more than what you see. All of that is a truth. But when it gets out of balance, you can't just go, you know, I don't feel good today. Could y'all pray for me? Because it got to a point with some of my friends that they could never admit they were having a sick day. But was the word of faith revelation, real revelation? Absolutely. Do we throw it out because it got out of balance? No. We add it to the wall. When I say these words to Generation Z and, and, and above, a God of love will one day be a severe judge. It bends them because they don't understand that the God of judgment and the God of love are the same God. And there's a balance. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass at just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. So y'all, y'all with me? So I want to take you on a little trip here for the next few minutes and I'm going to need your imagination. Have you got your imagination? You know, I don't believe in checking your brain at the door when you come to church. Okay. Don't check your brain at the door. Use your brain, but I want you to do this. Imagine with me that you're God. I want you to think for a minute as I take you on a journey through the old Testament, God as a person, who enjoys, loves, thinks, feels. Right? While he's almighty, of course, but he's a person. You'll read in the Old Testament of places where he was angry. You'll, you'll hear words of love and affection in the Old Testament from him. Same God. For a moment, I want you to imagine your God, not, the, not from an all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent point, but from a relational standpoint, I want to take a journey with you through the scriptures and I want you to see God's interaction with man. And I want you to see how we as mankind have treated God. Why is this important to worship? Because you need to know who you're worshiping and you need to know how to approach him. If you approach him as supreme and always right and full of judgment or whatever, then you will never approach him the right way. Many religions have taught us to fear him in the sense that he's going to strike us dead. Can he do that? Yes. But is that his nature? No. And we'll show that to you. Genesis 2, 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. Jumping down to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you eat, you will surely die. Everybody say surely die. <laughs> Remember that we forget that in this story. God also in this passage gives man total dominion over the earth, over the serpents, the creatures, everything. And in his instruction as God, he says to Eve and Adam, 
Everything is for you. Everything is under your control. But one tree don't eat. Now, again, we're going to be God a minute. How many of you have children? You got children? I have children. You want to give them the best you can, right? And the only thing you're going to try to keep from them is the thing that would damage them or harm them. And sometimes even good things in excess will harm you. So as a father, I'm trying to say, look, you don't need that, but the rest of it's here. But there's an innate thing called rebellion in human nature. It's in us. It came down through Adam and Eve, and it's come through every generation that somehow thinks we're missing out. Let me tell you where it comes from. The feeling that you're missing out on something wonderful comes and originates with Lucifer himself. Because Lucifer was a beautiful star of the morning. The Bible says, full of wisdom, the sum of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Had access to anything he needed access to except the Godhead itself. It was never going to be Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Lucifer. But Lucifer is supreme and beautiful, and he's, 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 I guess there's mirrors in heaven, because he knew he was beautiful. And he obviously had angels walking up to him going, Lucifer, you should be included. Is anybody listening to me? You should be included. And something in Lucifer started growing that I want access to God himself. I want to be a part of everything. And that same thing we see in Adam and Eve. The, the, the serpent is talking. Let's look down in verse uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God, here's how the devil always talks to you. Remember this, always in questions. And he always questions what God says. Because if he can get you to doubt what God says, you'll go, you'll go down the road he wants you to. Has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Again, he's talking to her about two different deaths. Adam and Eve are thinking physical. The loot, but the, the devil speaking through the serpent knows it's spiritual death. You're not going to die, for God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Again, there it is. Keep me out of something that I think I'm entitled to. You're going to be like God. Your eyes get open, knowing good and evil. So the woman said that the tree is good for, saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. I could preach here for about an hour. She took the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband and he ate. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now look at this. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day. He did it every day. In verse 8 it says, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now look at that again with me. They heard the sound. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking. They knew he was on his way. And they hid themselves. I want to interject that people are still hiding themselves from his presence. And worship is the unveiling. To come into his presence. And I understand that Adam and Eve probably felt ashamed and disappointed and that they had disappointed God, but also they were hiding from physical death. They were trying to save their hide. They knew he had promised death to them. 
So they're hiding. As you know, the story of Adam and Eve, God removed them from the garden and they lived under the curse of sin and death. He put a cherub at the, a cherub, cherubim at the entrance of the garden so they couldn't come back in. Adam and Eve had every access to everything in the garden except one thing. Now, again, think like God a minute. You've given your child everything they need, but you've asked that they not do one thing. What did Adam and Eve do? The one thing. What would you, as God, think about that? You would first be angry that they had disobeyed you. Then it would go deeper into your person as a thinking, feeling creature, and you would go, why would they do that? When I've given them everything I know to give them. Have you ever heard that in the anguish of a mother or father that has a child that's wayward, but they were raised just like all the other kids in the house? But there's one who no matter what you do is going to do the wrong thing and hurt you and hurt themselves. You can hear this in God throughout the Old Testament. I've given you everything. I've only said one thing you can't have. Why must you push for the one thing? God is looking for people to be his friend. Not because he's lonely, but friendship means there's a two-way street of trust. God wants to be believed and trusted. And those are the two hardest things sitting here in this day and age with all that's happened in the world in the last year, it's the hardest struggle that humans are having right now to believe him and trust him. What's the news saying? I don't know. What's the word say? Well, what's going to happen to my money? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Well, what are the politicians going to do? I don't know. What's the Lord going to do? Where are you looking? Who you're, who's your focus on? Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. 9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest Cleveland, Tennessee 37312. Thank you. God bless you and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. God finds a couple of friends in the Old Testament that, that light his day. In Genesis 6, 8, and 9, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And I love this line, Noah walked with God. So God finds a friend in Noah, someone to walk with. Let's move on past Noah. We know that story well. Let's move to Moses. We're going to land on Moses for a minute. Moses has a real unique friendship with God. It's amazing to me. Moses is this guy who was raised in the palace. He knows what's good. He's destined for greatness. But he sees an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew and he slays the Egyptian and becomes, he becomes a criminal on the run. He runs away from his destiny and he finds himself in the wilderness taking care of his father-in-law's flocks and the Lord says, okay, Moses, it's time. You're 80 now. Somebody says, how long is it going to take me to get to God's best? It depends on you. The quicker you learn to trust <laughs> and obey, for there's no other way, 
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It took Moses 80 years. God says, go down, Moses, down to Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. I can't go. I stutter. <laughs> go down, Moses. You know, when God's asking for something, it's not a suggestion. And he's never given you an option. God is not a God of options. He's got one thing he wants you to do, and he wants you to do it. He's looking for a yes, sir. That's all he needs. Kind of like real fathers. When I tell my boys, I just need yes, sir. I don't need, well, what if we did? Well, what if we, well, what if, we, but, but could we, but no, this is what, yes, sir. Right? I can't speak plain. I, 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 I stutter. Can't you find somebody who can talk without stutter? Okay, Moses. Let's take Aaron with you. Got rid of that excuse. They go down and you watch all the miracles happen. You watch the plagues happen. The people are belittled. The people have been in bondage, slaves for 400 years. Their morale is low. They're sick. They're tired. They're broke. They've worked as slaves, building pyramids, Nursing the babies of their masters, cleaning and scrubbing the floors of their masters. And here comes stuttering Moses. Pharaoh, you got to let the people of God go. Now, what's God thinking in all this? Okay, I took away his excuse. Now I got Moses down there and he's doing this. He's obeying me. This is awesome. We're going to see something happen. You watch all these plagues come about. Are y'all with me? Moses <laughs> says, not only are you going to leave, but we're going to leave in style. There's going to be a supernatural healing revival that happens throughout all of the camp of the Israelites, and you're going to be healed. They leave the house in the morning. Grandpa's 98 laying on a cot, breathing his last breath. When they come back and it's the day to go, grandpa is up. He's already cleaned the house. He's got everything packed. He's ready to go. He's as surprised as if he's 20. The nurse who took care and slaved after the Egyptian woman goes up to the Egyptian woman's house and goes, hello? Yes? I guess you've heard we're leaving. Yeah, I've heard you're leaving. Pharaoh wants you to go. Well, I, I kind of need some things. What do you need? I need that really cute turquoise outfit that you wear all the time. <laughs> with the shoes that go with it and the earrings. I need it all. And what does the Egyptian woman do? I, I'm paraphrasing here. I mean, Eugene Peterson did it. She goes, you know what? I have had, I've got a white one and an orange one and you can have them all. I had them clean. Just got them from the cleaners. They're all yours. Just take them. With this, the man gets a little bit of uh, backbone about him and he says, uh, well, you know, we're going to need money too. The Egyptian man does not question. He takes him to the vault in the house and unloads it. The Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. That means they took their goods. I mean, this is kind of, be God a minute. Will y'all work with me? I'm going to bless my kids. Their disobedience got them into this mess, but I'm not going to leave them in this mess. I'm going to get them out of here. And when I get them out, I don't do anything halfway. I'm going to bring them out big time. Oh, they're about to come out. I mean, they are coming out on a level nobody has ever seen. I'm going to show my power, and they're going to love me for this. My babies are going to love me when they see what I do. They have gr groaned and complained for 400 years, but they're going to bless me now. The day of the exodus, hundreds of thousands of Jews carrying the wealth of their captors. 
Grandpa's dancing and playing the fiddle. God is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is great. I mean, they're dancing out the gates. Headed to Canaan land. I'm on my way. Where the milk and honey flow, where I get a house I didn't have to build and a vineyard I didn't have to plant. Ain't God great? Until we get to the Red Sea. You know, there's always somebody in the group looking backwards. Uh, Moses, those of us that are kind of watching the rear, we're noticing clouds of smoke. We see dust. It looks like a vast army. They're coming after us. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Now, I'm sorry. Can y'all work with me as God? Y'all are being God right now. I just took the money from your captors. I just nearly raised your grandpa from the dead so he could walk and I'm really going to do that. I mean, some of y'all need to wake up in this hour and see what God's about to do. Y'all have worried yourself slap out of faith. You ain't got an ounce of faith left. You worried it out and you don't read the word. It's proved over and over and over and over and over and over. God loves impossible. Impossible activates God. I mean, if anybody can do it, he'll let anybody do it. God likes it when it's only me or nothing. <laughs> he loves that. And he does it for your good and your joy. And he gets the glory. So suddenly God has allowed them to be killed by the Egyptians up against the Red Sea. It's all going down. We're all dead. It's all over. But their leader has a different attitude about God. Let me jump. I'm going to jump out of sequence here. And I'm going to take you to uh, Exodus 12. Now, the children of Israel had done according to the word. Uh, verse 35. Exodus 12, 35. The children of, of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given people, the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered. <laughs> it's a celebration till we get to the Red Sea. <laughs> then we move here. When Pharaoh drew near, Exodus 14.10, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were very afraid. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then Moses said, then they said to Moses, is the people talking to the deliverer? Moses is the deliverer. God has sent him to be a deliverer. He's already faced Pharaoh down for all the plagues. He's already got them wealthy and healed and got them here. Listen to some spoiled bratty children who don't trust their father. He's only as good as his last miracle. They have no memory. No memory of the goodness of God. When Pharaoh did, they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt. I mean, listen to a snotty remark here. I mean, this is awful. This is not just, we're scared. This is, let's be scared and be a jerk at the same time. Can you hear the sarcasm? Well, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us? To bring us up out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we were told in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptian than die in the wilderness. Are you out of your mind? 
You're sitting there with bags of silver you can't even carry. God has healed you of cancer. God has restored your health. And you can't trust him? The best worship tool in your wagon is memory. Because you're going to run into situations where it's going to feel like God's nowhere near. But that's when you worship. And you worship him for what he has done. Not necessarily what you see him doing. They didn't have that ability. Waters part, they cross on dry ground. They get, I mean, think about these little brats. Just be God, okay? I'm going to be God. Okay, Moses, sorry. I'm, I know they're a pain. <laughs> You'd think money and, 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 and health would be enough, but I guess we're going to have to get them out of this jam. Um, now, I could just slay the army, but let's do something more spectacular. I mean, God could have just went, and Pharaoh's gone. But God doesn't do anything the way you think he should. Let's do something where there'll be stories written about this forever. And maybe y'all will praise me for this. Moses, stretch your hand over the water. <laughs> Dry ground. Take them through. They're walking through watching sharks and whales swim. <laughs> this is cool. It's even dry. I mean, there's dust bottom of the ocean. This is cool. They get to the other side. And again, because God didn't immediately close the water like he should have. They stood on the other side and looked back and went, oh, we're all, we're dead. Couldn't praise him because five minutes ago you just walked through on dry ground. Couldn't praise him because God in the middle of an impossible situation made a way of escape where there was no way. No, no, no. He didn't do it my way and he's letting my enemy come after me. I wish I could preach to some people in the world right now. Didn't go my way. I'm mad at God. Try humbling yourself. We grew up, I grew up in black church, black churches, Church of God in Christ. I didn't, I was the only white person in the church. East St. Louis, Church of God in Christ. And we had some songs that maybe the grammar wasn't the best, but it kind of went like this. God is God all by himself. He don't need no help from nobody else. <laughs> God says, oh my, my, oh my, oh, oh me. <laughs> Moses, just do the hand thing again and we'll get this handled. Now, the enemy for 400 years is floating dead in the water, washing up on the shore, and God goes, okay, surely I'm going to get some love. I want you to be God. Surely, I had a little praise coming out of Egypt, but maybe we can have like a me moment. Maybe they'll appreciate me for what I've done. Maybe they'll walk with me. Maybe they'll care about me. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll cultivate me. Maybe, maybe they care about me instead of themselves for a minute. And God gets happy because they bring out the B3 organ, a Hammond organ. Those of you who aren't musicians can't have a revival without one. <laughs> and Miriam gets the tambourine and they start dancing and they start singing. It's found here in uh, Exodus 1430. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which God had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord. Oh, we got a good start. That's the beginning of wisdom. They feared the Lord. They believed the Lord. 
and his servant. Well, duh, I would think you would. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song. Notice how worship happens at miraculous happenings of God. Because God does great things for you to notice him. <laughs> and to focus on him. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider was thrown into the sea. And they're dancing and kicking it up. I mean, Lord is great. Dead Pharaoh. Jesus is alive. Well, he wasn't Jesus just yet. He was there, but he wasn't revealed as Jesus. He, God is great. Jehovah is God. I mean, tambourines. I mean, I mean, they're having a fit. Dancing their full head off. Crazy. And God goes, Michael, I don't think I hear complaining right now. What do you say we go near? Let's go near. The Bible says he's enthroned on the praises of his people. Let's go sit down right in the middle of that because we don't get much of that. Anybody here? We don't get much of that. Let's go sit right in the middle of that. And he sits there and he just lavishes in the love of his babies. Remember, you're God. Your babies aren't complaining for a minute. They're magnifying how wonderful you've been to bless them and provide for them. Oh, bless the Lord! Because the Lord has triumphed greatly. What a wonderful God we serve. Oh, Father, you're great, you're great, you're great. After a little bit of dancing, they go on through the wilderness and they're all thirsty and tired. And the praises cease when all that dancing made them thirsty. They're going through the wilderness and they're thinking, man, we got to have something to drink. Moses, we're going to die out of here. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing because it's you. Some things never change. What shall we drink, Exodus 15, 24? Then they start complaining about the food. I know it's nice to walk out and just pick up your breakfast. Falls out of the sky every day, but could we get Italian manna? <laughs> I mean, you know, could we have a little spice to it? Maybe some Mexican manna? I mean, I mean, must it be the same thing all the time? We've got stacks of bland manna. <laughs> Moses just for. Bear, just forbore these people for years, forbear them and dealt with them. They had a rock that followed them. Water would, every time they camped, water would gush out of it. Food falling out of the sky. These are hundreds of thousands of people. At night, the fire of the Lord, they would see it. In the day, they'd follow the cloud. God was visible up front, accessible to his people. He showed himself all the time. And on every hand, no matter what miraculous thing he did, it was never enough for them. You see where I'm getting with this worship teaching? Let's cross-reference that to today. I've had a bad day. I'm not going to worship the Lord today. Brat. The doctor said I'm going to die. God hadn't healed me yet. Paul would have said, well, goody, shortcut. <laughs> but you would say, oh, it's awful, horrible. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, God's probably going to let my children starve. And after I'm gone, my children aren't going to serve the Lord. It's going to all go to 
It's going to go to the, the valley, the pots, terrible. It's going to be horrible. In other words, God was strong enough to save you, but he can't take care of what's yours. Really? Really? I'm going to backtrack and show you one scripture, and I'll show you why Moses was so loved by God. Exodus 33, 13. Moses speaking to God, I pray if I found grace in your sight, show me your way. To my knowledge, it's the first time in all of the Bible. And one of the very few times, if not the top five, in all of the Bible where anybody cared enough about God to say, I want to know your way. God says, Moses, anything you want. You found faith, you found grace in my sight. What do you want? Ask. And Moses, because he was a true friend of God, he didn't just sing the song, he was. He said, show me your way. Why? That I may know you. That I may find grace in your sight. And consider that the nation, this nation is your people. And he said, God said to him, capital H there, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. You see that? When the presence of the Lord goes with you, there's rest. But you have to get the cart and the horse in the right place. Rest is for those who want to know his ways. Not just for people who want something out of it. Rare is the friend that you have in your life who will attend to your cares and needs over their own. Even rarer in the church and the kingdom of heaven are those who care for the needs and desires of God above their own. Rare. You'll find it in the Bible. Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, just don't even bring us up from here. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So shall we separate your people and I from all the people upon the face of the earth? And so Moses, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. What that means is we're buddies. I have found a friend. And look, oh, 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 oh my, my. Look what, look what God says to Moses. You found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And what does Moses reply to that? Please show me your glory.